And we are going to get started with our new read aloud. It's called Tolliver's Secret Esther Wood by Esther Wood Brady. I do encourage you as we go through this book, you'll actually get to see it. And I would like you to make sure you take some time to look carefully at the pictures because they kind of help you visualize what's happening in this story. Chapter 1. Grandfather must have lost his wits. Ellen was sure her grandfather had lost his wits when she saw him slip into the dark kitchen and lock the door with a big key. Without giving his usual cheery greeting, he tiptoed to the window and pinned the heavy curtains together with a knitting needle. Don't want anyone peeping in this morning, he said to Ellen's mother who was making bread on the table by the fireplace. Lights from a small fire on the hearth darted the big old kitchen. From the dark corner where she sat brushing her hair, Ellen could see light glimmering on a tiny silver box he carried in his hand. Is the loaf ready now? Grandfather whispered to her mother. Mother's white cap fluttered up and down, but she did not speak. Very carefully, she patted and shaped a small round loaf of bread. Well then, let us go ahead, grandfather said as he gingerly placed the silver box on top of the lump of dough. Ellen stared at the little box. It was his favorite silver snuff box. She was too surprised to speak when she saw him press the snuff box into the dough, smooth over the hole that he had made and dust off his hands. His round face had a wide impish smile. No one will find it there, he said gleefully. He stepped back and cocked his head to the side. Bake it crisp and brown, Abby, with a good strong crust. It has a long way to travel. You're quite sure no one will find it, father? Mother sounded frightened. Now, don't worry, Abby. No one will find it. He patted her shoulder and gave her a kiss. Ellen saw that he was wearing the white wig with the turned up tail that he always wore when he went to the tavern. Underneath his blue wool coat, he wore a long waistcoat with brass buttons down the front. He was short and stout, and the buttons marched down his waistcoat came in an outward curve. He never wore these clothes when he worked at his barber shop. Ellen was so puzzled she had to speak up. Whatever are you planning to do, grandfather? Quickly, her grandfather spun around and peered into the deep shadows of the kitchen. He gave a sharp cry that made her jump. I thought you had gone to the corner pump, Ellie. Ellen curtsied. I was just about to make the bed, but I'll leave now, Grandfather. She picked up her red cloak and pulled the hood over her long brown hair. Grandfather stepped across the room and grasped her by the shoulders. Don't ever speak of what you have seen, Ellen Tolliver, he warned in a gruff voice. She had never heard him use before. He was usually so friendly and cheerful, even in the early morning, even with the British officers around. But now his twinkling blue eyes looked as hard as points of steel. Ellen was so startled she dropped her cloak. But I was just wondering... Stop. You are no longer a babbling child, he said sharply. About this, you must never talk. Do you hear, Ellen Tolliver? Ellen nodded. Grandfather wasn't acting like himself at all. Suddenly, with his usual cheerful smile, he bent down and hugged her to the, his side. From under his wig, she could see some of the sandy red hair peep out around his forehead. I must have alarmed you, Ellie, and I am sorry he said as he kissed her cheeks, but this is something of concern to me. Very great concern. And only your mother knows about it. No one else. But now that the three of us know, the three of us must keep it a secret. Ellen nodded. She wasn't sure just what the secret was, but she certainly would, would not talk about it. Shh, shh, shh. Mother took off her white cap and pushed back a curl that fell across her forehead, leaving a smudge of flour on her brown hair. She cocked her head and listened for a noise upstairs. Shh! No telling who might be awake up there. In the bedrooms upstairs lived six British officers who moved into Grandfather's house when the Redcoats took New York three months ago. Ellen disliked those officers, always sniffing snuff up their proud noses and sneezing daintily into their white handkerchiefs when they weren't striding about giving orders. She hated the way they ordered Mother to bring tea and biscuits to them every morning, but still, they were the masters of the house now. Ellen and her mother curtsied whenever they saw them and stepped out of 
of their way politely. Just pay those redcoats no mind, her grandfather had told them. Sometimes in the evenings he would mimic them. He'd take a pinch of snuff from his snuff box, and with his little finger crooked, he put it on the back of his hand and sniff. Then he'd sneeze and sneeze. He'd put his nose in the air very haughtily and dance about the room, flipping up the tails of his coat. The red coat mignonette, he called the dance. Come and dance the mignonette, dear lady. Ellen would pick up her skirts and dance with him, holding her hands high, pointing her toes and tossing her head as if she were a Tory lady wearing a big white wig. When they finished the mignonette, they'd whirl about the room until they fell back laughing in their chairs to catch their breath. It was fun to do silly things with grandfather. Ellen's father had never played like this. He had been very serious. Sometimes mother would dance too, pretending a wooden spoon was an ivory fan. It was good to see her laugh after all these months of worry. Now in the early morning half light, mother pointed up to the ceiling. Be very quiet, she warned. Someone may be awake up there and hear us talk about the bread. We must be very cautious. They stood still and listened. Ellen shivered at the sound of the wind howling over the rooftops, but she heard no stirring of the redcoats upstairs. Lazy lobster backs, grumbled Grandfather. They're still a bed up there. They spend their evenings in the taverns and sleep until noon. Grandfather always got up early, and he thought everyone else should too. For years and years, Grandfather Van Horn had been a barber and a wig maker in the town of New York. Nowadays, his shop in the front part of the house was filled with British officers who came to have him shave their chins or powder their hair or dress their white wigs. The British officers liked the cheerful little Dutchman. Ellen watched her grandfather take the wooden bucket from the hearth and look inside. She knew well enough what he would say. What a lug a bed you are, Ellen. You haven't gone out to the pump yet. She picked up her red cloak from the floor. It's because don't like snowy mornings, eh? He teased her. I may be a stubborn Dutchman, but you know I like the bucket full of water first thing in the morning. Sometimes you're so late I can't wash my face until seven o'clock. I'll save water for you to wash your face, father, mother said hastily. Ellen is just slow to get started in the mornings. I know how she feels. Slow, cried grandfather. She's like a turtle. It seems to take her an hour to come back from the pump. It, I used to buy water from the day, the dray man, but I thought it was good for Ellen to go out. She stays indoors too much. Mother's eyes were anxious. Her face was so thin now, it made her eyes look huge. I hope you'll excuse her, father. She began slowly as she tightened the knot of brown hair at her neck. She's not used to this to this town yet, living quiet as we always did in our little village. We've been here scarce a month, and it takes time to get used to different ways. Nonsense, said grandfather. He poured the last of the water into a mug and handed the bucket to Ellen. Perhaps she should tell him why she was late every day. She knew he would think it was not very important, but it was important to her it was. I I'm late because of that tough dicey at the pump, she said. What's a dicey, said Grandfather. Dicey's a girl. Everyone is afraid of her. She says she's going to wring my neck, and I think she means it too. Is that the way she talks to you, Ellen? Mother asks. Whenever Ellen thought of dicey, she could almost hear her rowdy laughter. It gave her a hollow feeling in the pit of her stomach. She screams at me, and I have to go to another pump farther away. Fiddlesticks, says Grandfather. Just stand up for yourself, Ellen. That's what I did when I was a boy and small for my age. Ellen doubted she could stand up for herself when Dicey went blustering about like a tough butcher boy. Ellen's not a boy, Mother said quietly. She can't royster about like a boy. Oh, double fiddlesticks, said Grandfather impatiently. She could talk back to that little girl at the pump. Dicey's not a little girl. Ellen protested. She's bigger than I am and she's mean. Talk back to her anyway, Ellen, grandfather urged her. Don't be so meek and mild. Mother seldom spoke sharply to anyone, but now she folded her arms and looked at grandfather. Her father wanted Ellen to be ladylike. 
she said. You remember my husband was a schoolmaster, college educated. He knew all about training children. Yes, I suppose he did, said Grandfather. Indeed he did, Abby said firmly. He was very pleased with Ellen's quiet ways and her pretty manners. Grandfather looked puzzled as he watched her put the loaf of bread on a long-handled shovel. It was plain to see that he didn't understand his daughter. She looked so much like him, and yet they were so different. Well, Abby, he said, your husband was a good man. A very good man indeed, but, he reminded her, Ellen can have pretty manners and still be bold when she needs to be. She can learn to stand up for herself. Not like a boy, Ellen repeated her mother's words. You know I can't fight like a boy. You don't have to fight back with your fists, said Grandfather impatiently. Use your brains, Ellen. You're a smart girl. Bluffer. Stare her down. Get your friends to join you and chase away the bully. I don't see how I could do that, Ellen said. Her big brother, Ezra, often said to her, don't be so scared, Ellie. Just talk back to people. You're too polite or timid or something. Ezra was a carefree boy with auburn hair and a wide smile like grandfather's. He'd talk back to anyone, even the captain of the village militia. Well, said grandfather, you're a smart girl. You'll think of a way. Now that the oven at the back of the fireplace was hot, mother raked out the coals and slid in two long loaves of bread. She took the last look at the mysterious round one before slipping it in two. Grandfather unlocked the kitchen door and went into the shop at the front of the house. The tail of his wig turned up jauntily as he straightened his coat and picked up his cane. Why in the world did Grandfather put his snuff box in that loaf of bread, Ellen whispered. Best not to ask any questions, Ellen, Mother said. Grandfather came back to the door of the kitchen and winked to Ellen. Just go and stand up to that dicey, he urged her. You have more of your grandfather's spirit than you think, Ellen. And now, Abby, I'm going to the tavern for breakfast and to hear the news. I'll be back when the bread is baked. He glanced up at the little square clock that hung on the wall of his shop with a pendulum swinging slowly back and forth. You remember the shop is closed for the day, he reminded her. I've given my shaver a holiday. The young man, Alexander, who lived in the attic and who helped grandfather in the shop while he learned to be a barber, had gone off last night to visit his family. Grandfather gave Ellen a big smile. That girl Dicey sounds like a bully, he says. She'll be back down. You're she'll back down if you stand up for yourself. Ellen wasn't so sure of that. It may have been true when Grandfather was a boy, but she knew it wouldn't work now with a tough girl like Dicey.